Hey guys, welcome back. We have our next lecture on the Reform Era series, the Golden, uh, excuse me, the Gilded Age. Uh, and today we are going to be taking a look at some of the political and social reforms that took place during this era. So, you know, we began the unit by taking a look at some of the problems. And especially when it came to politics, there was a lot of corruption that was starting to happen with the rise of the political machines led by men like Boss Tweed and Tom Pendergast. Today we're going to look at some initiatives that were put in place to actually stop that corruption from happening. We'll also take a look at some of the social changes that are occurring. We began our unit by taking a look at reconstruction and seeing in particular the plight of the African American uh, in the reconstruction and post reconstruction period. We're going to look at some things that were done to uh, try to push for more equality, although a lot of work would be left to be done uh, in the future. So let's go ahead and get started with our notes and uh, take a look at some of the results of this progressive era. So again, beginning with politics, some, uh, some new things are added to our democracy that are still being used today. Um, first of all, the initiative. Okay, an initiative is a bill originated by the people rather than the lawmakers. So you may have been out maybe shopping or something and somebody approached you about, you know, signing a petition to get something on the ballot. That's an initiative okay, where they actually are trying to go to the people saying that this law needs to be passed. Our legislature won't do it and we the people can do it. So the initiative, uh, if you collect enough signatures, you follow all the rules, you can get something on the ballot without having to go through the traditional uh, you know, legislative process. Now, if you do uh, follow all of that process, um, you know, you get enough signatures, you uh, follow all the rules, then you will have what's called a referendum, and that is a vote on the initiative. Uh, and at that point, if it passes, it becomes law just like any other bill. Uh, and if it fails, it uh, does not. Uh, the recall, uh, the removal of public officials. I cannot uh, see the word recall without thinking of Arnold Schwarzenegger, both for total recall, but also um, because he actually became governor of California as a result of a recall. Uh, the governor of California at the time, uh, very unpopular, uh, a lot of unpopular decisions, and the people actually organized a recall. There were enough signatures on the ballot to have a recall to where there would be another election, basically in the middle of this guy's term, uh, I think Gray, I think his name was Governor Gray. Um, and there were enough signatures that they were able, able to have a recall vote where he went up against, uh, in this case, Arnold Schwarzenegger, of all people, uh, and Schwarzenegger ended up winning. So that is how the Terminator became uh, the governor. Sorry, I had to do it. All right, let's move on to the next page, direct primaries. Uh, you, if you are of voting age or your parents, um, hopefully have participated in our democracy by going to vote uh, and during the election time. A few months ahead of the election, we have what are called primaries. And this was a new addition in the early 20th century. And this really is what took power away from the political machine. So if the political bosses were able to kind of hand pick who they wanted to run for certain offices, the primary was what got rid of that power. In this situation, the voters selected who they wanted to run for their party. So in a primary election, there's no one actually elected to office. It is an election to see who will run for that party. So when the, they choose candidates um, through this method, it, as I said, eliminates the need for a political machine because the people select who they want and you have less opportunity for a more corrupt individual to be put in that position. The 17th Amendment is a very important amendment, uh, and this is one that I, I still struggle to remember that uh, it was not this case uh, always, but um, before the 17th Amendment, uh, the election of U.S. Senators, okay, our U.S. Senators was actually selected by our state governments, okay? The, uh, uh, the state legislature would vote on who would become the U.S. Senator. Well, the problem is if you have a corrupt state government, you're eventually going to have a corrupt uh, federal government. And so this was in an attempt to, once again, eliminate the power of the political machines, even on a national level, uh, and to directly elect those who represent us. So the 17th Amendment, a great amendment for our country to eliminate corruption. The Pendleton Act, um, 
uh, we talked early on about the spoils system and how some people were getting jobs even though they didn't deserve it and uh, whatnot. The, the Pendleton Act required that some, in particular, government jobs were required to have an application process alongside of it. Now, that might seem normal, but uh, it's only normal to us today because of the Pendleton Act. So, um, you know, the the, the goal here is to limit the spoil system, that you wouldn't just get a job because you were related to the mayor or uh, that you owed someone favors, that you were actually the best candidate for the job. Once again, strengthening uh, you know those that had positions of power in the government. Now let's talk about suffrage. We ended the first part of the unit by taking a look at the fact that, that women still don't have the right to vote. Um, you know, early in the 1900s even, still did not have the right to vote. Uh, this was not a new argument. Women had been pushing for the right to vote uh, for a very long time. The, the first real official push that was made was in 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York, although there were people that were pushing, of course, well before that, but this was the first real organized effort. Uh, and what they're pushing for is, is the term suffrage. Okay? Uh, it might seem like a strange term, but suffrage means the right to to vote. So you had the first women's convention, and uh, of course women were uh, the ones that primarily organized this, trying to get uh, a voice for themselves in government. Uh, one of the main leaders was a woman named Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and she would become uh, one of the pioneers of uh, the suffrage movement, and um, she would actually be alive during kind of the second wave. You see, 1848, that's about uh, less than 20 years before the Civil War, and even though the 15th Amendment you know, went uh, far enough to give uh, African American males the right to vote. It still did not uh, incorporate women at this time, so it was kind of a missed opportunity. And frankly, there wouldn't be another opportunity uh, come up until the early 20th century, until um, some very strong ladies uh, took to the streets and uh, made this a national issue. In 1890, the National American Women Suffrage Association, or NASA, uh, first organized uh, once again by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She was still alive at this time and uh, helped get this movement going. The woman pictured here, Susan B. Anthony, who is also commemorated on certain U.S. coins, uh, Lucy Stone, Julia Ward Howe. All of these women were the leading suffragists uh, that allowed for you know, the, the pressure to be put on politicians to get this law passed. Uh, one of the big public um, displays that they put on to, uh, you know, try to gather support took place uh, the day before, I believe it was President Wilson was inaugurated. And, um, you know, what we've seen sometimes, um, you know, with, with this issue, but even more recently with things like uh, gay marriage, uh, you know, what happens is individual states start passing laws regarding that on their own, uh, and then eventually it kind of gets popular enough that uh, eventually there's a federal law introduced or uh, a Supreme Court case that may overrule something. Uh, and in this case, uh, you, you had individual states begin passing laws allowing women the right to vote. I believe Wyoming, don't, don't test me on that, but I think Wyoming was the first state uh, to allow a woman to vote. I, I believe also uh, uh, supplied the first um, uh, woman senator as well. Again, I'm spitballing here. Um, but in 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified and it gave women the right to vote. So what that meant was uh, women officially had uh, an equal say in, in politics, uh, officially. Uh, uh, there would still be a lot of work to do. In fact, we will talk about the women's rights movement of the 1960s and 70s that will be coming up later. But um, this was a major step towards that later movement uh, in, in just simply getting a, a right to have a voice in your government. It almost seems um, you know, hard to believe that uh, you know, up until or really 100 years ago, uh, women didn't even have a vote. The issue of child labor was a horrible one. By 1910, uh, there were over 2 million kids working in industrial settings. Of course, kids were, um, uh, in some cases, preferable to adults because they could be paid a lot less. And as we discussed, a lot of health problems, a lot of kids that were, you know, of course, not getting an education, but also dealing with long-term health consequences. Um, you know, you can't be a coal miner at the age of eight and expect to grow up as a healthy child. So, um, you know, a lot of serious health problems because of child labor. And thankfully, uh, that started to change early in uh, the 20th century, the Keating Owen Act. Um, did a lot of good things. It prohibited transportation of goods across 
uh, that were made with child labor across state lines. So basically, if you had a factory and uh, you made your goods using child labor, you were not allowed to sell your good across state lines. Um, and that's good in practice. Uh, in fact, a lot of, of companies start turning away from child labor because of this. Ultimately, that law got overturned in 1919 because it does, in fact, violate some of uh, you know, some constitutionality, which uh, denies the ability of the federal government to inter, uh, basically kind of intercede between interstate commerce um, and slow that down. So, uh, yeah, I think probably the correct legal uh, uh, response, but... Uh, you know, it did go a long ways in, in starting that conversation. By 1920, the number of child workers in this country had been cut in half. So luckily that uh, started to gain momentum. And again, a lot of states began passing laws on their own before the federal government even got started. One of the pioneers of the uh, anti-child labor movement was Mary Harris Mother Jones. She had a somewhat tragic previous history. Um, she, her entire family basically had died due to yellow fever, um, a, a terrible, deadly disease. And um, she became kind of the mother of all these uh, child laborers. And uh, she led strikes. She was a uh, she led major protests. Um, the, the the picture down below is one of my one of my favorites in this unit because uh, she actually in, in one of her most famous protests. Um, she marched 80 children directly to the front stairs of the White House at the time. You could actually walk right up to the White House. And she basically banged on the door demanding to see the president and making him look all these children in the eye uh, and basically said, why aren't you doing anything about this? I've always found that to be uh, uh, pretty amazing. So, uh, you know, individuals that are making uh, such major changes in this country. I think that's a tremendous lesson to us uh, that we can make a change, just even normal people. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit, and uh, this is going to highlight some of the problems we talked about in the very beginning of the unit. Again, the, the Reconstruction era and all the, the, the racial issues that uh, were created or, or at least exasperated during that era. In 1879, that's about two years after Reconstruction supposedly ended, 1879, you have kind of the first wave of African Americans move out of the South. You know, it, it is not easy to move across country. Um, you know, it often takes money and uh, time. And uh, frankly, the, the poor people that had recently been, you know, freed, um, which, again, is 14 years after the Civil War. This is not ancient history. So, um, you know, many of these people uh, were, were unable to move previous. But uh, you have kind of this first wave out of the South. And uh, in particular, these exodusters, uh, with the root word there being exodus, okay, if you're familiar with your Bible stories, uh, you know, Moses leading uh, the uh, uh, children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, okay, they referred to themselves as uh, exodusters, uh, with their exodus from the south into, uh, of all places, Kansas, okay, and Kansas has a, a history there of, um, of course, uh, you, you have, uh, with the founding of Kansas, you had it, it as a free state, um, and so there's kind of this, this history of anti-slavery um, in Kansas. About 6,000 people moved out of the South into Kansas over the next two months, and I'll, I'll mention, you know, 1879, Kansas is still kind of frontier. I mean, especially along the western side, uh, it is not, uh, you know, an, an urban metropolis, uh, you know, that it is today. No, just kidding. Uh, if you've ever driven through Kansas, and no offense to my Kansas friends, but, uh, you know, you've ever driven through Kansas, uh, you know, once you get out of the eastern side with all its cities, man, it is uh, about as boring as it gets. Uh, it is, is quite flat. Parts of it are quite beautiful, but uh, it is quite flat. Back to the, uh, the original point here. I'm getting off topic. Um, we, we're going to talk about a couple civil rights leaders and, you know, this early civil rights period, very, very important in laying the foundation for the modern civil rights period that took place with uh, men like Dr. King and Malcolm X uh, that we will cover in our spring semester. Uh, the man pictured in the upper right hand corner is W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, civil rights leader. And the, what I want you to remember about Du Bois was, uh, you know, he took uh, kind of a, a harder line. You know, he actually 
um, you know, said that, you know, this struggle, we, we need to put pressure on the system in order for it to change. It's not just going to change out of the kindness of people's heart. We have to apply pressure protests. Uh, you know, we have to do things to challenge the system. Now, one of the organizations he helped create was the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Now, the NAACP was very important at the time, uh, still very important, one of the strongest, um, in particular for African-American uh, civil rights, but, uh, you know, a team of lawyers that would help challenge those whose rights had been violated uh, and give them some representation when it came to the court system. Now, on the opposite side of the coin, and I always kind of argue, you know, Du Bois and Washington, these guys were, I think in a lot of ways, kind of arguing towards the same end goal, but they had very different ways in getting there and, and really disagreed with one another strongly. Booker T. Washington, and Washington believed that change could come through cooperation, that, um, that, that through support for, from white and blacks alike, uh, that you could end racism in the long run. So, uh, you know, as the, the lines there says, work with the system to change it. You know, he, he was a firm believer in democracy, that people can vote for the right leaders that will make the right decisions. Um, but it, it starts even at a more grassroots level than that. Booker T. Washington said the basis for change is going to take place in the African-American community in which people are educated, are able to have strong careers, contribute to the community and, uh, you know, basically um, kind of earn that respect to where people will want to change the, the rules because of it. Um, you know, some historians have pointed to Washington, of course, a very, very important figure uh, and an important part of this process, but uh, also, I think, somewhat naive at times because, uh, you know, most people don't change, especially when they're at the top of the social ladder, uh, unless there's a, a major reason to. So, you know, Washington did an amazing thing of, of you know, pushing this idea of education in particular by starting up his own schools, uh, the Tuskegee Institute, which he started in Alabama. Uh, and the main goal of the Tuskegee Institute, this uh, school for, for all black school uh, in Alabama, was to educate those, frankly, to educate others. Uh, it, it taught teachers um, to take, you know, certain skills, and particular farming skills, trading skills, uh, to go back to their own communities and to teach others. You know, he understood that education was something that, um, you know, uh, you know, one, once you, you know, it's like the old saying, you know, you can either give a man a fish or teach a man how to fish, right? Which one is more valuable? Well, of course, uh, you know, teaching a man how to fish, it's the same thing. You know, if, if uh, you can strengthen these communities by teaching others how to teach others or to teach other people certain skills, you can strengthen these communities, strengthen the economy of these communities and make them a viable part of, uh, of communities, states, and then, of course, the nation. Now, w, uh, excuse me, Booker T. Washington uh, gave a speech in Atlanta in which he outlined a lot of his ideas, and this became known as the Atlanta Compromise. And, um, you know, I, I will say men like Du Bois uh, were very much outspoken against the Atlanta Compromise um, because they didn't think it, it went far enough and, and frankly kind of gave up too much. In this speech, Washington outlines his belief that says, you know, we, we need to reach a compromise. You know, whites are not going to be willing to give up political rule. Uh, and instead, as long as uh, they can guarantee certain basic levels of education and, you know, shelter and, and make sure that African-Americans have due process, um, he said, you know, allow them to have the, the political spectrum. Uh, you know, as long as we can have an opportunity to actually succeed economically, then that should be a compromise between uh, whites and blacks. But um, like I said, that, that was not well accepted everywhere and, and often very critical, saying that, um, you know, you allow them to, to continue to have the political power, nothing's going to change. And, uh, you know, I think time would, would tell on that one eventually. But, uh, um, you know, it, it does show, again, kind of the end goal was the, the same, I think, for both men to have to have a stable, economically equal um, uh, African-American communities in this, in this country, um, but the very, very drastically different methods on how to get there. Um, the final civil rights uh, leader I'd like to include in this era, and we'll, we'll talk about more later on, again, in our civil rights unit, uh, was a woman named Ida B. Wells. Uh, she was a, an African-American civil rights leader who uh, took up a, a number of issues. Um, the two issues she was known for most uh, were her dedication to suffrage. Um, she worked alongside some of those women I mentioned earlier, including Susan B. Anthony and uh, others, um, 
to uh, to try and gain women the right to vote um, successfully, I, I may add. Um, but uh, another issue that perhaps she was even stronger in was uh, to promote an anti-lynching law. We have not uh, really covered yet the horrors of lynching in, in the South in particular. This was a nationwide problem, but primarily in the South. And... Um, the, uh, the fact is, in this Jim Crow era that begins during Reconstruction and lasts well through the 1960s, uh, this Jim Crow era uh, saw a lot of um, uh, vigilante justice, if you will, but frankly just mob, uh, mob violence. And many African Americans found themselves um, a, a target of these, these mob lynchings. And we'll, we'll cover some of the numbers later on. Um, but thousands upon thousands of African Americans would be murdered uh, by mobs in this extrajudicial setting. And frankly, many of them were going unpunished, um, many of those that had committed these atrocious murders. And so th she worked furiously to, uh, to pass a law um, that was an anti-lynching bill. Basically, if you were found to have committed uh, a lynching, that uh, the, the penalties were much stricter than uh, they would be for other uh, similar crimes. So, um, you know, there had to be something done because too many people were literally uh, getting away with murder, and this was one step towards uh, creating a more just society. I believe that's it. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to in industry on our, uh, our next unit, um, but hopefully this gave you a good look at how politics began to change, society began to change, and in particular for uh, the role of African Americans in, in this nation. Um, you know, these strong uh, individuals that work so hard for a more equal and just society. I think regardless of our, our race, we can all thank them for their efforts at that time. Um, once again, I appreciate you guys watching this lecture, and please let me know if you have any questions. I'll be happy to get back to you.